Welcome everyone. You should be able to see my screen now on your screen. We're picking up the study today with 2 Corinthians chapter 3 as we continue the review of the epistles of Paul. Uh, the second book or second letter written to the Corinthians obviously is a response after the first letter. The many things that Paul had written there that we covered and he's writing again 2 Corinthians to encourage them and praise them, if you will, for the things that they had done, but to continue to address also some other things. One such thing was um, the calling itself, because part of the problem in 1 Corinthians was that there were false teachers that had made uh, inroads, if you will, into promoting wrong teachings. One such teaching was that Christ had already returned. Um, there were aspects of Gnostic teachings that were being incorporated. There was the aspect of circumcision that was being taught by Jewish adherents that believed that was required for salvation. Um, there were those that said Paul doesn't have any authority and they were misusing gifts and many of these sort of things. So Paul comes back to this topic in this chapter, the theme, if you will, of being he and those that preached to the churches that God had placed in those responsibilities, that they were ministers of a new covenant. Now, the greater context here is that, unfortunately, many in the, the broader context of mainstream Christianity misunderstand what Paul is writing. And you have to understand Paul's approach, if you will. The apostles that Christ called to be a part of his earthly ministry were for the most part, essentially what we would call blue collar men. They were fishermen, they were tax collectors, they were, you know, kind of the middle class, if you will. Paul came from a background of being in, deeply involved in the Sanhedrin. Um, when we're introduced to him in the book of Acts with the account of Stephen, he is basically their hammer, he's their enforcer, because the Jews saw this rising Christianity they were very concerned about it, mostly because it was taking away their power, if you will. There were people that were no longer coming to the temple to do sacrifices. Um, they had marginalized the widows, so the widows left. And of course, those that were going to take care of the widows left. And so they see this exodus and they're, they're very concerned. They're trying to hold on to what they had um, and it's not working. So Paul was initially part of that. Of course, in Acts 9, God calls him, Paul changes his mindset, not in what he believed, but how he practiced it. And God used him then to go out to the Gentiles. But Paul being very educated in that Sanhedrin world, in that priestly world, he wasn't a priest, he was a Benjamite, but he was deeply immersed in that culture. He was very intelligent and he was very learned. We know that he trained at the feet of Gamaliel, uh, that's recorded in Acts and we know that he spoke several languages. And so Paul's writing style is a more uh, academic, if you will, writing style. His sentence structure is different, his word use is different, and he gets into deep themes. So you compare that to a Peter, or you compare that to a John, or you compare it to some of the other writers, and it's notable. So John's writing in what's called a high style. He, he's very meticulous in how he's writing. And unfortunately, as that's translated, especially into English, the phrasing that Paul uses is misinterpreted and misused by many. So that's kind of the background for chapter three here. So we'll just read it. Paul writes at the beginning here, are we beginning again to commend ourselves? So, um, Part of what Paul had to address, again, going back to the first letter, was this disrespect for the office that he had and the disregard that God had placed him there. And so he, he says, do we have to go back to that? Or do we need, as do some, letters of commendation to you or from you? And one of the practices that happened in the church almost to the modern time, up, up until, well, probably around the time of the Reformation, is that the church of God, as ministers might travel for whatever reasons, whether they would be sent or whether they were just kind of making the circuit of churches, if you will, 
if they were going into an area where they were not known personally, and you have to understand, we live in a world that's very easy to know who somebody is. If I get a name, I can do a Google search, you know, a member, uh, a potential member calls me up. I can go online. I can search their name. I can find out a fair amount of information about somebody that's just out there. Um, I can pick up the phone. I can call another pastor. Hey, this guy's coming into the area. He's offered to help. Can you give me some background? We have that level of communication where back in this time, they would literally write a letter, who, whoever, somebody like Paul, they would write a letter. They would hand it to the individual and say, when you get to the other congregation, give them this letter as a means of introduction so that they know that you're a true representation or representative of the church, you know, that I'm okay with you know, you being there, serving, doing these other things and so forth. So Paul's being kind of rhetorical and a little bit, I won't, snarky is not the right word, but he's kind of being pointed with him. Do, do I need a letter of recommendation in order to speak to you? Verse two, he says, you are our letter. You know, the, the evidence of what Paul was doing as a minister of Christ was evident in the congregations, the, the people that he was serving, teaching, um, ministering to. He says, you are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. So again, these letters of introduction would be written, but he's talking about those sent by God specifically. Um, during, well, not during this time period necessarily, but shortly after the death of Paul, leading up to the time of the end of the first century with the Apostle John, and then especially moving into that second century AD, there were a lot of heretics that would write letters and use the names of individuals like Peter or John or whoever, uh, very deceptively. So this is part of why he's saying, look, you know us, you know what we've done, what we've done in serving you and all of these sort of things. And th this is his introduction. Again, this goes back to the first letter where he's having to defend his apostleship. Now, in this case, he's not defending his apostleship, but he's defending what he's teaching as an apostle. So in Acts 18, verse 27, I have a note there. This is uh, the ministry of Apollos. And it says, breaking into the thought here, and when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, in this case, it was the congregation wrote a letter basically vouching for Apollos. He says, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Because again, it, unless somebody had traveled through an area or it, like, unless they were really well known, um, sort of a, le a level of public recognition within the church, these letters would help introduce individuals. So verse three, Paul continues here, being revealed that you are a letter of Christ served by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of living God, not in tablets of stone, but in tablets that are hearts of flesh. Now he's talking about a couple of things here. One of which is he's praising them for their own example. They of themselves are a letter, if you will, of introduction for anybody that would, would come and be a part of either a local congregation or interact with them locally or whatever it happened to be. So you are the letter served by us. The us are those that went under direction from God to go preach the gospel. And in this case, establish these congregations. So I read about Apollos in Acts 18. It's certainly Paul. It was Silas. It was Barnabas. Um, it was John Mark. You know, it was these different ones that were out um, pastoring, serving as ministers and so forth, Timothy, Titus, all of these. So the us is inclusive in the ministry. But he says, not written with ink, so not a physical letter, but with the spirit of the living God, what was written on the heart. And this goes back to Jeremiah 17, where God said that he write in the hearts of his people, his law, his way of life, not on a tablet of stone like Moses brought down on the Mount, um, the mountain, but rather internalized. This is why we don't do tassels. This is why we don't do the yarmulke that you know we wear on the head. This is why we don't do those physical things. If God is writing his law, if he's giving us his spirit, if we're internalizing this, 
those physical outward things are, are not sinful in that sense, but they're not necessary. They can become sinful if those become badges of righteousness, um, which is a tendency, unfortunately, with human nature. We want to make sure people know. Um, so verse 4, such confidence we have through Christ towards God. So Paul is praising them here while defending what it is that he's teaching. And he gets into that more here as we progress. Verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to account anything as from ourselves. This is not, well, what I'll say is locally. These are not my congregations. I pastor the congregations. I've been given authority and responsibility to say and do certain things, but they're not my people. They're God's. This is what Paul's saying here. Look, we have done these things to serve you, but it's not for us because he says our sufficiency is from God. To what level we do the things we do, to what level God has inspired us comes from him, all of these things. So, continuing his thought in verse 6, he says, who also made us sufficient as servants of a new covenant. And so, this is where many get into this distinction, if you will, of what's called Christology and Pauline theology. And those are theological terms for basically see, saying what Christ taught versus what Paul taught. And there are many, unfortunately, within Christianity that say what Paul taught either supersedes or does away with what Christ taught. That's a pretty arrogant position in my estimation. What Paul's trying to do is explain and elaborate on what Christ taught. And oftentimes because of his style of writing and the wording that he chooses, this is why it gets misunderstood. So this new covenant is New in the sense that it does what the old covenant could never do. The old covenant brought an understanding of sin. It brought up a level of understanding of expectation of what we should do in living our life. So the Ten Commandments are part of that. But then you also have the Noatian covenant. You have the Abrahamic covenant. You have the Davidic covenant. You have these other covenants. And, and sometimes they were specific to a generation or a time period, if you will. In other cases, they were more general in the sense that they were to the nation themselves. But with the exception of many of the things that uh, were in the covenants that pointed to what God was doing ultimately, the most of the particulars of those covenants don't apply to us. We can still be recipients, like with the Abrahamic covenant. God promised Abraham the descendants, he promised them, you know, what many will call um, race and grace, you know, that there were areas of the world that God was going to bless them with, the sea gates, and he was going to bless them with abundance in land, and whether it's crops, animals, all these sort of things, you know, and we see that in the modern nations of Israel, but we're not under the covenant that God made with Abraham in terms of to Abraham specifically that is being fulfilled but we're more specifically under the new covenant. What is the new covenant? Well, the new covenant is God's spirit. The limitation of the old covenant was it never promised eternal life. None of them did. It identified sin, but that's that's only part of the, the story, if you will, isn't it? Because in recognizing sin then, as Paul elaborates in Romans, three Romans six and these other places the, the price of sin is death it has to be accounted for if we're looking at an excel balance sheet you have your income you have your expenses and hopefully you have more income than expenses but it has to balance it you know most businesses want to present a balanced budget there are many that will go for a deficit budget hoping that they'll make money because of the things they're spending their deficit on but you look at governments, and when they get too heavily into deficits, then they've got a problem because then you lose trust in the financial institutions and so forth. But to go back to the analogy here, the old covenant never balanced or reconciled the price of sin. So the hope in the Old Testament pointed to the new. 
This was the hope of Abraham that looked for a city without foundations. This was David understanding, you know, my Lord said to his Lord, uh, or rather to he, the Lord said to my Lord in Psalm 1, 110 there, um, you know, knowing that Christ would rule, knowing that there would be a, a kingdom established that would do these things. It, the hope was those things to come. Well, the hope came with Jesus Christ. Through his sinless sacrifice as a member of the God family. And again, this is something that many can miss. The value of Christ's sacrifice was not just that he lived a sinless life. Christ himself said, you know, if Noah and Job and Daniel all lived a perfect life. And they lived a pretty good life if, if they're being acknowledged by Jesus Christ in terms of a spiritual walk. And yet he said, even if they were perfect, meaning completely sinless, they would only save themselves. So it's not the sinless life that saves us. It's the sinless life of God coming in flesh, dying in payment of those sins so we can be reconciled, so we can have the hope, so we can have God's spirit in us. So the rest of what God wants to accomplish the destiny of mankind, if you will, the potential of mankind can be fulfilled. That's the new covenant. The new covenant then is the spiritual intent of the law. It's not the letter, just the letter. Yes, we have to not kill somebody, but Christ explains you have to go further. You can't hate them because that's the heart issue, isn't it? Going back up to verse three, where Paul talked about not writing on tablets, I mean, this was the Jews, right? They would not physically kill somebody, but they would create the circumstances and they would provide the person to do it, but they themselves didn't so that they could pretend that they they were guiltless in all of this. You know, Judah paying him to go betray Christ. You know, Paul initially, Saul, going out to kill people like Stephen or to put them in prison, you know, it's just all these things. So it's not just the letter. We keep the Sabbath from sundown to sundown. That's the letter of the law. But the spirit of the law changes how we function within that day. And this, this is the difference in that new law. Uh, it doesn't negate the aspects of what God lays out in the Old Testament as far as behavior. But that behavior is not just what brings salvation. It has to be God's spirit changing us into the new man that Paul talks about in Romans and other places. Um, and so the spirit of the law on top of the letter of the law makes it much more personal, makes it much more internal. Because I can pretend on the outside, I can pretend to be a, a really good person. I can say the right things, I can do the right things, but in my heart, I can be thinking all kinds of evil things, awful things plotting and planning. So the difference again in application is under the new covenant, we have access to eternal life. So to continue in verse six, so it's the servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills. That's, that's the consequence, isn't it? That's the payment, if you will. So if we go to Romans, Romans 6 and verse 23, we read that the wages of sin is death. That's the letter, right? The letter of the law only brings death. It identifies what brings death, but it only brings death. To continue here in verse 6, 2 Corinthians 3, but the spirit gives life. We are saved by Christ's life. The sin is paid by his death. We're not saved by his death. We're saved by his life in us. His death balances the sheet. It reconciles the cost of sin and then us being able to move forward. The payment is made. Sin requires a payment. And so this is the distinction that's missed by most. So the new covenant is not solely based on the letter, but rather on the spirit. Because the spirit is much more extensive, isn't it? And we learn this as we follow God's instruction over the course of our life. When we first start out, it tends to be more letter of law, doesn't it? 
So how we keep the Sabbath, how we keep the holy days, the way we tie, what food we eat or don't eat. You know, we're very meticulous in the right way for those things to be part of our life. But as we practice those things, then we see, well, you know what? It's not just this literal 24-hour period of the Sabbath. It's how I think and how I honor God and how I praise him and how I, I stop from my common work of the rest of the week, and I focus on him and what he's teaching me, that becomes a much more internal exercise. So to continue in verse seven, then he says, but if the administration of death, some translations will say covenant, that's why I have that, this original translation here, this is the WEB, World English Bible. I like the word administration because it is how it is applied. If the administration of death written engraved on stones this is a, an allusion back to the ten commandments what moses brought down off the mountain if that came with glory so the children of israel could not look steadfastly on the face of moses for the glory of his face which was passing away won't the administration of the spirit be with much more glory i mean moses was literally in the presence of the being we know as jesus christ now even then, he said, you can't look at my face, right? He told Moses, kind of stand here in this little crevice in the mountain. So you're kind of protected peripherally. When I pass by, you'll see my backside. You can't look at my presence, my full presence, because it that level of energy and power would kill Moses as a physical being. But even with that, when he came down the mountain, there was this such a glow off of his face, light emanating off his face from being in the presence of God that he had to put a hood over until it eventually faded. So Paul's asking the question, if in that letter of the law covenant, this is what Moses looked like and the glory was, that was there, how much more glory is going to be in the spirit of God and what he's doing in the new covenant? So verse 9, for if the administration of condemnation has glory, there is value in the law. And this is part of what's missing in mainstream Christianity as well. So they'll say, well, we're under the new covenant. The old covenant is done away with, technically true. But then they'll say, because Christ fulfilled the law, they think that means finished the law, not understanding the wording or the context. So then I don't have to even consider that. Okay, well then how do you understand what it is the spirit of the law intends if you don't have the letter, letter of the law? We're just deciding on ourselves, aren't we? There's, there's no standard there. So the value also of the letter of the law is to understand the standard. And so even though there was condemnation and, and glory, both of those things, in that old covenant, He's using Moses as the example. Then again, consider how much more is, is in the new covenant. So verse 10, for most certainly that which has been made glorious has not been made glorious in this respect by reason of the glory that surpasses. For if that which passes away was with glory, which, excuse me, much more that which remains is in glory. So again, the law is not stripped away. The reference in Matthew where Christ says, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And even in that, most people miss that. He, he literally says he's not destroying the law. He's not voiding it. The word fulfill means to magnify. And the spirit of the law does magnify the law, doesn't it? You, you go back to the intent of the law. The letter of the law is a guide for behavior again, but the spirit of the law goes to the intent. What is it supposed to accomplish? It's not just an absence of something. It's not just not doing something. It is what it points to. Why do I not want to kill someone? Humanly, there are times where we do want to kill someone. I mean, this is wars. This is, we can kill somebody, assassinate their character is an expression we use, right? We can emotionally damage people, physically hurt people. Well, why do I not want to do that? Well, as we understand 
more fully as God and his spirit working in us brings us to this understanding. He is love. And I, I am convinced even within the church, we don't understand this to the level that we should. Because think about the current conflict anywhere in the world. Palestinians and the Jews right now in Gaza, the Russians and the Ukrainians now in that area of the world. We've got conflicts all over the place. And from a Western perspective, we would say, well, we need to help the Jews. Okay, well, that's noble. But can you do that without hating the, the Palestinians? Now, they have done some awful things. But quite honestly, many times the victors of whatever war have done some horrible things. World War II was such an example. How did the Allies begin to turn the tide against Hitler? Well, a lot of it was gaining a foothold on European soil. D-Day invasion and U.S. forces and Allied forces began, you know, multi-front attack. That certainly was a huge element of it. But the other thing that a lot of people don't like to talk about was the bombing of the industrial areas and the cities that the Allies started doing. They were just destroying these areas. The firebombing of Dresden was one of the most devastating events in terms of civilian casualties in World War II. That was the Allies. But see, because we're the victors, we set that aside. But when you understand what God is doing with mankind, he's created everyone, all of mankind in his image, which means they all have the same potential to be in his family. So even if they're doing awful things, God still is hopeful that they can be taught. Right? He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. He still cares for them. He still provides for them. He doesn't like the awful things that mankind can do. And we know how that will be addressed in time. But this is part of what Paul's talking about here. The, the law, the physical covenants, those things will pass away. Right? Ultimately, all prophecy is fulfilled. All covenants are fulfilled on that human level. Then what's left? What's left is what God adds by the new covenant, his spirit in us. That mind, that character, God then makes eternal. And so to continue in verse 12, he says, then having therefore such a hope, I mean, this, this is the only hope, isn't it? Most people don't think of those big questions of life. Why do I exist? Usually. I'll, I'll say usually, it's sort of qualified, obviously not everybody, but usually the only time people will consider a question such as that is when they're extremely depressed and in some cases, many cases, even suicidal. Do I even matter? That's just one question. Who is God? What is God? What is man? You know, modern intellectual teaching has come to the conclusion man is just an advanced animal. Well, that strips a lot of hope out of it, doesn't it? That, that means the only thing I have is this life, which then helps to understand why people pursue the things they pursue, because they're trying to fill it with pleasure. They're trying to fill it with the things that will make them happy. They're trying to make this life count, because once I die, there's nothing in their estimation. So this is the hope. And he says, having therefore such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Paul. Every one of us should be excited to teach people of this. And even if we don't teach it in literal speech, what our words say, going back up to verse 2 and verse 3, we should be a letter in everything we say and do, whether we're preaching God's word directly, teaching someone doctrine, answering their question, why don't you keep Christmas? Why don't you eat that food? Why do you go to church on the Saturday, on Saturday, all of the, whatever it is, whatever it is we're saying or doing, even outside of that, is it boldness? Or are we trying to make sure, well, I'm going to obey God, but I don't want to draw any attention here because I don't know how people will react. Paul never pulled back. Eventually, God used that, and Paul died. But so did Peter, so did James and John, so did Zebedee, so did uh, Matthias, so did, you know, the other apostles. Are we willing to be bold? I think 
again, personally, I think this is the difference the church of God is going to make in the end time. We won't convince people of our speech, but the boldness of our speech will make them stop and think about it. God then can use that. This is the seed being sown. Verse 13 then, and not as Moses, the boldness of speech, the hope we have, not as boldness who put a veil on his face so the children of Israel wouldn't look steadfastly on the end of that which was passing away. Even that literal glow, however we would describe that, the light that was emanating off of Moses' face, it eventually faded, didn't it? It went away. The law that God taught Israel it didn't fade away in that sense, but it did pass on, didn't it? Because now the new covenant is there to magnify those things. So that law as it was applied in Israel's case has passed away. It'll still be a foundation for the nations in the future. But the promises made to Israel, the expectations given to Israel as a nation, they they aren't living under that now, are they? You know, so it passes away to end of verse 13, or I'm sorry, let's read verse 14. But it, but their minds were hardened. This was the constant frustration, if you will, that God had with Israel. At times, they would listen to him. They would yield to him and submit to him. But typically, it would only last a couple of generations. They, they, they would begin to drift, and their hearts would harden. Well, it's really not important. Well, it's too hard. Well, that's really not what God intends. Well, that may be good for some, but I, I'm not going to live that life. I want to go do what I want. So that's this hardness that comes in. Their minds were hardened to the point that when the Jews, the Pharisees, especially the Sadducees of Christ's day, they literally had the Messiah standing in front of them, wanting to teach them teaching them as well, but wanting them to understand, I should, I guess, say it a little clearer, and they couldn't accept it. They were so entrenched in what they believed God had to do because of what they thought the, the law meant, what they wanted the law to mean. And, and that hardness prevented them from, from even seeing what was in front of them. That's the caution for us. I've unfortunately seen people harden their hearts over the years. And you can, over time, you can see God's spirit lead them because there's no place for it. It can't take root. It can't flourish and grow. It can't change them. And so then they, it begins to remove that and they go back to their human nature in, in, you know, without God's spirit. So um, their minds were hardened. Verse 14, for until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains because in Christ it passes away. Without the spirit of God that comes from and with the new covenant, the veil is still there. Paul writes of that in 2 Corinthians 2, we read earlier. Um, they were blinded, right? Um, Ephesians and other places it talks about this veil and this blindness that you can't see literally because your eyes, speaking figuratively, are covered. You can't see. And so then you don't understand the intent of the law, the spiritual intent of the law. And so the veil remains. And because then they don't have an understanding of what it is that Christ is doing. So verse 15, but to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. But verse 16, whenever one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, there are two components to this. You have to have the heart to listen, but God also has to sort of prime the pump because on our own, we're not going to come to God. Human nature and Satan stirring up that human nature it's not going to listen to God. That's the world around us. That's the world around God's people down through time. But if we begin to be receptive, then God can then begin to work with us. And the giving of his spirit is kind of like turning on a tap. You can turn on a water faucet really slow and you can get a drip, 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 
You can turn it up a little bit and it drips faster. You can turn it up a little bit and you get a really tiny, steady stream. And you can continue to turn that faucet open more and more and more until it's as much volume as the, the pipe has in it. But God does the same thing with us spiritually. Who knows how many people are out there that are getting booklets and magazine and watching Beyond Today program and, and listening to videos and maybe encountering God's people at work or in the neighborhood or as a family member. And it's just the, the drip, drip, drip. And maybe they're still blinded by the veil. They, they have no reason to pay attention to it in their minds. But maybe if God begins to lift that veil a little bit, that drip, drip, drip begins to have them start to think about things. What they read in the magazine, what they heard in the program, what they read in the booklets, what they hear in whatever sermon videos they might listen to. It begins to then have them think differently, doesn't it? And God then begins to work with them. That's our calling. For some people, that drip, drip, drip can be there for decades. In other cases, maybe the drip is quicker. And maybe in some cases it's the drip, 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 and they're turn, they're wanting God to turn the faucet on more and more and more because of the eagerness to learn. They see the contrast of what God is offering, what's in the world, what they didn't understand. They they hungrily desire what God is giving them. But it has to be God working with them. And then the veil is taken away. It begins to be written on our hearts, right? Because then what Paul talks about in the, in the law not being necessary, what, once it's written on your hearts, you don't need the law. What do I mean by that? Okay. Let's say you have, well, I'll use my personal example. Roxanne and I lived in Rhode Island in New England for 16 years before coming to Wisconsin. The drivers, <laughs> usually on the coasts, things are different. And one of the things that are different is it's different up in that northeast corridor is that the way people drive it's a very aggressive way of driving if you're on the highways the speed limit signs really aren't paid attention to and the cops the policemen really don't care if you're speeding as long as you're not being crazy and making it risky in the traffic if you're weaving in and out of lanes and you're aggressively speeding up and braking that will catch the attention of the police but if you're going with the flow and you're doing 20 over the limit they don't have the time to stop everybody. The, the traffic has to flow because there's just so much traffic. Well, you get used to that. So I came to Wisconsin within the first three years, I had four speeding tickets here in Wisconsin. I, I wasn't used to just paying attention to the speed signs and, and not being so aggressive. I didn't get tickets for aggressive, it was all speeding tickets. Because you just, in New England, you just drive because there's usually traffic around you. Well, that had become a habit. And until I began to pay attention to uh, the speed limit signs, that I just kept getting the speed limit, uh, speeding tickets. Okay, well, the law was there. Once I realized I had to change the way I thought about driving, I didn't have to be so aggressive in terms of speed. I didn't have to be so worried about not impeding the flow of traffic um, and all of those things. Once that began to change in my mind, I, I can't remember the last time I had a speeding ticket. Probably goes back to 2008 or so. It's been a quite a while, but you have to internalize that, right? I don't think about the speed limit signs. You just, you have muscle memory. There are times I, even locally, I'm driving home, some of the back roads, and it's like, oh yeah, I need to pay attention to my speed. I look down, I'm doing exactly the speed limit because you begin to internalize it. This is God's way of life. The law doesn't have to be a constant reminder because it's in us with God's spirit. This is the new covenant. Again, the law is not done away with, internalized with God's spirit. That changes how it impacts our life, how we live it. It's no longer checking a box off. Okay, well, you know, I stopped. You know, sunset is at uh, 4.12 p.m. And I stopped at 4.11 just to make sure. And I made sure I didn't do anything for the next 24 hours. And then Saturday night at 4.13, I realized, you know, I could change clothes, I could begin to do some things around the house or, you know, whatever it is. That level of the law is not necessary because you're, you're not watching the clock. You're not worried about the letter of the law because you've internalized it. You begin to 
disengage earlier in the day. Your mind is already thinking about the Sabbath. You're already planning, you know, in terms of being there at services and you're reading maybe more in your Bible Friday night or Saturday morning. You have the time to relax and maybe even just sit in a comfortable chair with a hot coffee, a cup of coffee or something Sabbath morning, and you're just meditating on God's word. That internalizes. So it's just the, the spirit of the law internalizes it to the level that we don't constantly think about the law. But the law is there again to identify sin. There are times as God works with us with his spirit that that becomes the thing, right? Maybe we've been baptized 10 years or 40 years or whatever it is. And we listen to God speak on the Sabbath through whoever he has appointed on that day. And some verse is read or some comment is made in connection with a verse. Or as the message progress, we stop individually. We stop and think, I, I'm not doing that. And so it just becomes more. It grows. The law has identified the sin. We also know that the law, that the, the hope of the new covenant has covered that sin, which means now we're free. And Paul's going to get into this with the liberty. We're free now to go live the spirit of the law, which under the other old covenant, we couldn't. You know, we could have lived uh, a life like Manasseh. You look at Manasseh's life, King Manasseh in the Old Testament, who was not a good king for about 40 years, a really awful king. He made it acceptable within Israel to have child sacrifice. Um, we're not told directly, but I suspect he even sacrificed one of his child, one of his children, because his son Ammon was not his firstborn. And then God leads him into captivity personally, right? He's taken by the king of a foreign nation. He's put in prison. He's in there for years, and, and God got his attention finally. The prophets that God sent, he wouldn't listen to them. He wouldn't listen to God's word that was recorded literally as, you know, a book, if you will. But when he was in prison, he had time to stop and think. And when God restored him, he undid all those things. But let's just look at it in terms of the penalty. He still would have been under the penalty of the law, wouldn't he? Even in his repentance, without the hope of salvation, the law would have required his death. Let's flip it around. You could live a perfect life. So let's say you die at 80. You live a perfect life for 79 years, and then that last year, everything just falls apart. You violate God's law in just so many different ways. The 79 years does you no good, does it? In the end, under the penalty of the old covenant. But that's the hope. Once the penalty is paid for, then we're free not to do what we want, but to live the law as God intended, the spirit of the law. So then he says this. Let's continue in verse 15. To this day, when Moses is read, the veil is on their heart. We touched on that. Verse 16, but whenever one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This is God beginning to impart his spirit. We come under the new covenant of the sacrifice of Christ and the giving of God's spirit and living in the law. So then verse 17, now the Lord is the spirit, God in us, Philippians 2, 5, taking on the mind of Christ. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The liberty is being free to live in God's spirit, which we can't do under the old covenant, can we? Because that the penalty has not been taken away. It's the letter. When we have the spirit of the law, then there's liberty. We understand even the commandments and other things under the old covenant on that level of the spirit of the law, not just under the letter of the law. So going back to Christ's example and the one I touched on earlier, it's not enough to just prevent yourself from killing someone. We can't even hate them because they're a child of God and the spirit is still the spirit of murder. So we look at all the other, other instruction in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, if we read it through the lens, if you will, of the spirit of the law, God's spirit in us and what he intended in the law, it points to what he wants us to develop in terms of his character. It has been said by many, 
But the commandments are essentially instruction on how to take on God's character. The first four to show us how God thinks, and the, the other six to show us how to interact with fellow man. Those are spiritual concepts, aren't they? I mean, I can, I can make my house devoid of any images. Not just images of what I think would be a God or a spirit being or whatever it had to be. Just any, any image. Does that mean I understand what that commandment is talking about? No, because I can still idolize things in my heart. The spirit of the law is the intent that there is nothing that stands between me and God, each of us and God. So this is the liberty. Now I'm free. I don't have to worry about those things. I don't have to wonder about all the little physical minutia because the spirit of the law will show me if I'm not doing the right thing. So maybe I don't stop to think about something within the law, and then over time, God's Spirit reveals it to me. Shouldn't use that kind of language. Oh, yeah, now I see why. It's not just a matter of not using a certain type of language in speech, whether it's vulgar, whether it's cutting humor, whether it's degrading, whether it's snide, whatever it happens to be. I understand my responsibility to be the letter, verse 2. To have God's glory reflected in us, um, that, that he talks with the example of Moses here in this chapter. There's liberty, it's freeing, isn't it? I don't have to worry. This is the constant worry within how the religion is practiced by the Jews. There's a constant expectation that I'm bumping up against sin. Well, on one hand, that's just a given. But on the other hand, I don't have to worry about that because when I see it, when God reveals it to me through his spirit and I acknowledge it, the, the, the price is paid for so that I can move forward and do better. That was always the intent of the law. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 18 to conclude here. But we all with unveiled face see the glory of the Lord as in the mirror. We should see God in ourselves. Not that we are God, the Father, God, the Son. That's not what Paul's talking about here. What he's saying is what God intended again from the beginning. We see God's character. We see him reflected in us. We see him as we, as we say and do things. And as we think, this is the glory that Moses had. He was reflecting God himself, literally. But we should do it spiritually. We should, it, it should be that when people see us, this, this is what, excuse me, this is what Christ said to the disciples, right? I think it was Philip that said to Christ, show us the Father. And Christ essentially said, have you not been paying attention? <laughs> you see me. If you see me, you see the Father. This is what Paul's talking about here as well. So you can see that Paul's not negating. He's not doing away with anything. He's not replacing Christ's theology and, and laying his own on top of this. He's explaining everything that's always been explained. We see with unveiled face the glory of the Lord as in a mirror. And we're transformed. The word transformed there in the Greek is the word we get in English as metamorphosis. It, it's a complete change, isn't it? That caterpillar goes into the chrysalis and the transformation is, is just down to a cellular level. Everything breaks down and it's reassembled into this butterfly. This is what is being talked about in scripture. We're transformed. We start out as a, a human being physical creation, with human and carnal nature, and with God's spirit working in us over time, we're broken down to that cellular level to become what God is. We're transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord, the spirit. From the glory of administration of death to the glory of the administration of the spirit, from the glory that men can have, because we're created in God's image, the intellect, the creative ability, the talent, all these things, there's glory on that level, but it's oftentimes used wrong, isn't it? So 
glory from that to glory what God would have us to be, just all of these things. That veil is lifted and we see God as he is with open eyes. So let's just read a couple of those verses before we conclude. So I have Romans 12, verse 2 there. This is the other verse that Paul uses the same analogy. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Again, that word metamorphosis in the English. Be completely created into something different by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is our calling, isn't it? This is what God allows in our lives in form of trials, uh, difficulties, persecutions, all of those things, whether it's financial, whether it's in a marriage relationship or other relationships, whether it's in a job, whether it's in whatever. God allows those things in some cases to correct us, to get our attention. Look, you need to pay attention. That's not going the right way. But in many cases, and I'm convinced in most cases, it's so that we learn a lesson in how to become more like him. The physical things are just the vehicle of how to do that. So Ephesians 4 in verse 22, Paul here again writes, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, apart from God's spirit. We literally age and die, don't we? But we also, if we're not careful humanly, over time, we become less What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, focused on maintaining a certain standard of character. We get old, we simply don't care. I'm just going to live my life. That can happen. But he's talking in spiritual terms here. So Ephesians 4 verse 22, we put off the old man, the man that existed before God called us, the one living in sin that leads to death. We put off that man. We put on a new man, as it were. We're put through the watery grave. We're resurrected, if you will, not literally, but understand the symbology. If you stayed in the water, you're dead. You can't breathe. So we're resurrected out of that to become something different, transformed, as Paul talks about here and as we read in Romans. So verse 23 here in Ephesians 4, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So then lastly, let's read Colossians 3 and verse 10. Paul again writes here, to have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The image being not just physically. You know, God has hands and arms and legs and feet and head and hair and eyes and all these things. We reflect that on a, on a physical level, the way we look, the way, way our bodies are created. But that's not only what it's talking about there. It's more specifically talking about the image, meaning character. We reflect God as we read in this verse. We look in a mirror and we see God because of him living in us. So Paul talks here, this matter of this new covenant, and it's just there's so much to peel back and understand and it's really unfortunate when people twist and misunderstand what Paul's talking about. The law is not done away with. The law is necessary to show us what we need to change. But the law is limited again in that it could not bring eternal life. And so then to account for that, if you will, God then sent his son to die. And on that human level to experience what we went through and through his blood, the, the balance sheet is reconciled. But then because of that death, God then is able to bring his spirit, put his spirit in us, and have Christ, if you will, in that sense, live in us, that we become this new man that Paul talks about in these other places. Okay, so we'll conclude it there.